Okay, and uh, welcome to another edition of Sales Chats brought to you by Pipeliner CRM. I'm John Golden, Chief Strategy Officer with Pipeliner, and I'm here in San Diego. And I'm joined in beautiful Vienna, Austria, by Marta Neumeister, who is our social media guru. So if you have any questions or comments, tweet them to hashtag sales chats uh, during this broadcast, and Martha will interject and, and let us know about them. Today, we're delighted to welcome Dan McDade, who's in the uh, wonderful state of uh, South Carolina. So welcome to Sales Chats, Dan. Great to be here with you guys, John. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the format, this is a rapid fire 30 minute session where we cover one topic and today's topic is prospecting. So before we begin, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Dan and, uh, and why Dan's an excellent person to come and talk to us about prospecting. So Dan McDade founded Point Clear in 1997 to help B2B companies with complex sales processes and drive revenue through lead generation, qualification and nurturing. So for over 20 years, he's been instrumental in developing strategies that assure 100% of leads delivered to client sales organizations are fully qualified to uh, client uh, specification. Dan's the author of The Truth About Leads, a book about how to focus lead generation efforts. And he also wrote the wonderfully titled From Chaos, From Chaos, if I can pronounce it, it'd be wonderfully titled, From <laughs> Chaos to Kick-Ass, an ebook uh, detailing benefits of sales and marketing uh, optimization. So welcome, Dan. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. It's a really super topic today. Yeah, it really is. So as I said, we're talking about prospecting. And that's the sales discipline that, let's face it, nobody really likes. Some people see it as a necessary evil, but something that, but we know that it's something that if embraced can really make a difference between sustained success and failure. So before we, before we dive into the details, Dan, can you just tell me why, why is prospecting so hated by many people and how, how could they look at it differently? You know, the problem with prospecting is it's not so much that it's rocket science, but there's a lot of moving parts. So you've got the list, uh, the message, the messenger, obviously. And um, I think one of the things that companies have to recognize is this is not every sales rep was created equally. So there are salespeople who are great hunters, and by definition, great hunters hate to beat the bushes looking for new business. You've got salespeople who are farmers, and they're among the most dangerous because Sometimes they think of themselves as hunters, and, and and they're not. You know, they're really they're good at farming business out of uh, current clients, not so much looking for new business uh, with new clients. And then the the actual uh, kind of the mentality, the difference between a beater, um, somebody beating the bushes looking for business, and a hunter, it's so dramatic that um, anybody who would be any good at one would be absolutely wretched at the other. <laughs> So, um, you know, our view is, is that whether you do something internally or you, you outsource, you have a blended approach, as many of our clients do, try to get more highly qualified leads into the hand of the field sales reps and let them go do what they do best, which is closing business. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along today. So that's, that's an interesting point to start with, though. So do you think that too many sales organizations or inexperienced sales managers try to as you say, almost create their salespeople as equal, like try to get them to be good at everything instead of specializing? Well, I do because, you know, the average company right now requires, and I'm talking really more here about a complex sale as opposed to a commoditized item or service, but in a complex selling environment, you know, you have as much as 60% of the business is required to be found by the sales rep as opposed to finding uh, the company finding it for them and providing it to them. And if they're involved in sales cycles, which take a lot of time and, and energy, be prospecting so you're going to have kind of an up and down we call it a bubble in the funnel you know where you sell 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 and then you deliver 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 and when you're engaged in a complex sale and you're down to the negotiations and you've got multiple decision makers involved it just is all encompassing and you're not going to find people prospecting at that time which they absolutely need to do so when is the best time to really start engaging with the prospect in in their buying process and and how how should you do that and who should do that um, that I could probably go on for an hour on that. That's my number one pet peeve. And what I want to do is I want to summarize um, a blog that uh, you folks were kind enough to run in the Pipeliner CRM blog. And 
And for one, what was the state of the market? Or what, what has been the state of the market over the last four or five years? And then how it's evolved and changed over the last several years. Um, going back to the past, okay, and this is very interesting, Serious Decisions reports that 70% of the buying process in a complex sale is already completed before a prospect is willing to engage with a live salesperson. Forrester said two-thirds to 90% of the buying cycle is completed before a B2B buyer even speaks to a sales rep. Um, IDG Business buyers spend just 21% of the buying cycle in conversations with salespeople while spending 23% of their time in conversations with peers and 56% of their time in the buying cycle searching and engaging with content before they have a sales rep get involved. Finally, uh, UBM Tech Web, 70% of business technology buyers are at the RFP stage or request for proposal by the time the vendor becomes aware of the opportunity. Now contrast that with current thinking and for all the sales reps out there, uh, my friend White, Mike Weinberg has a great book called New Sales Simplified. And if you're either a sales manager, you're aspiring to be a sales manager, then you can go out and look at sales manager simpli or sales management simplified. Two great books, but he wrote in one of his blogs um, that these experts have been telling anyone who will listen that buyers are 60% of the way through the buying process before engaging with a salesperson. Um, and, and, that is a, and that it's absolutely fruitless to cold call what some people call inter interruption marketing and proactively pursue prospects because it doesn't work anymore. And he says what's infuriating, aside from the fact that it's absolutely not true, is that this nonsense is exactly what the reactive and passive sales reps want to hear. They want to hear that it's fruitless to go out and cold call because they don't like to do it. They don't want to do it. Yeah. And they're just going to sit back and wait for the prospects to come from them. Uh, Mike went on in his blog when Serious Decisions came out and basically debunked a silly myth, as he referred to it, as today I'm celebrating as Serious Decisions publicly and authoritatively debunks <laughs> that silly myth, an off-quoted statistic at their annual sales Serious Decisions Summit. It turns out according to their own exhaustive research, that buyers are in fact engaging with sellers from the very beginning education stage through the solution of the selection. In fact, the highest level of reported buyer-seller interaction actually occurs early on in the education phase. And then finally, um, not to quote you to death here, but um, ITSMA's Vice President of Research and Thought Leadership, Julie Schwartz, Really, I think she says it the best. It's widely believed that 60 to 70% of the buying process is over before prospects want to engage with a salesperson. That premise, the premise is that there's so much information available online that salespeople are thought to be unnecessary in the early stages. ITSMA data says that for high consideration technology solutions, this is a myth. And she goes on to say that sales reps need to be involved early in the sales cycle. What I always tell salespeople is, is that if you wait for 60, 70, 80% of the buying process to be complete before you get involved, the chances are that you're going to be column fodder in an evaluation that's already been won by one of your competitors because they were more nimble and got involved earlier. Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with you, Dan. I think a lot of this uh, a lot of these myths have been very self-serving, to be honest. Uh, you, we've had the whole thing about uh, inbound marketing. Everything should you shouldn't you shouldn't go after people. Everything should come to you, and you just nurture them and all of that stuff. Uh, and I just think the reality, as you've just pointed out there through a lot of your data, is the reality is nothing has changed in terms of the motivated salesperson the one that has the skills, the smarts, the business acumen, they're the ones who will always want to get in early and they will defeat the people who are sitting back waiting for this so-called inbound marketing and all of this other stuff to just to feed their funnel with ready qualified uh, uh, prospects. So what are your Absolutely thoughts? Agree. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on that in terms of, you know, Tell me what makes a good prospector? What are some of the skills that make a good prospector? I think um, two words that we use frequently are that they're professional but persistent. Um, what you find is, is that through the sales process that there are salespeople who um, give up for what serious decisions refers to as unintuitive reasons. Uh, one example of that is you send a lead to a sales rep, the sales rep calls twice, the, the prospect doesn't call back, and the sales rep just ignores the lead and says it must not have been qualified. I think 
throughout the process, it's that persistence. We, we frequently have people tell us, and in fact, my favorite story about this is on the 42nd touch, the CFO of the third largest utility in the country called us back and said, don't stop calling me. You're my conscience. I've been wanting to talk to you. I've just been extremely busy. About five months later, literally that closed for a billion dollar deal for a wow. client that offered some professional services. So, you know, being persistent, not getting, um, defeated by uh, being ignored at least early in the stages. Another good example of that, in which we deal with with clients all the time is, is that when we set an appointment with somebody or a specific date and time for a follow-up call by a sales rep, up to 50% of those won't happen. And it's because th that's not because the prospect wasn't interested, wasn't qualified, it's because they got busy doing something else. And right. if you just take that at face value and say, well, they didn't show up for the call, that they must not have been interested, you know, that's going to hurt you over and over and over again. Yeah, I think those those are those are excellent points and really interesting points about uh, persistence. Because one one of the hardest things I think about sales is that your your uh, your prospect is not operating on your time scale, and you're not the only thing that that your prospect has on their desk for consideration. So as you say. I may be really interested to talk to you and then my boss comes in the door and asks me to take care of something else and now you suddenly drop to the bottom of the pile. Uh, but as you say, it doesn't mean that right. I'm not interested. It just means that the timing is off right now. So the persistence. So how do you, so how do you become professionally persistent? Because uh, I mean, like you, I'm sure, I get bombarded with prospecting emails all the time and I get the Oh, if you, I don't want to harass you. I don't want to bother you. But here's another email. But you are bothering me. And are you not the right person? Could you point me in the right direction? And all of these ones that just seem so lame, to be perfectly honest. Uh, uh, so, what are some of the best ways of being professionally persistent and not coming across lame like that? Well, I think it's adding value in the, as a part of the conversation. Um, you know, it's we, we, we talk about, you know, selling and then we talk about social selling and, you know, mm -hmm. social is really more about social than it is about selling. And um, I, what I like to go back to is I like to go back to that there's a process that most sales reps ignore, unfortunately, and it's because they haven't really been trained right. You find that the very best reps, the ones that can come across professionally while they are being persistent, are, are driven by really the five steps in the sales process. And these are five steps in the sales process that are generic, but they really apply to every sales methodology out there. And those five steps are, number one, find a pain. Uh, number two, get agreement that there is pain. Number three, get agreement to do something about the pain. Four, agree to a generic solution. And then five, agree to a customized specific solution. The problem with sales right now is, is that a sales rep finds a pain and goes right to a specific solution as opposed to going through all of the other steps. You know, how many times have you been in a selling environment where you found the pain uh, and they even agree that they have pain, but they never agree to do something about the pain. And then you're going to step five and they're back there stuck at step three. You haven't gotten them over the hump to actually agree to do something about the pain. And you're not going to sell in that environment. So that's the number one thing, I think, is to understand that there is a process of selling. And then I think, you know, the other thing about the persistence is, is that we, we talk about the categories of questions that, uh, that sales reps should answer or should ask. And that is that we'll, sub we'll summarize it by saying that there are pain questions, priority questions, process questions, and environment questions. And you, you don't want to question the prospects to death because they get very bored with that. And they expect you. I was reading a, an article, and I won't say who wrote it. It was 23 questions to ask, and they were the worst questions. This was very, very well thought of organization, but they were the worst questions. It's like, what are your priorities right now? What's keeping you awake at night? Those are absolutely the worst questions you can ask out understanding you know first of all you've got to find a pain get agreement that there's pain get agreement to do something about the pain agree to a generic solution that means that's kind of the rainbow what you know what would it look like if everything was rainbow mm -hmm. and puppies and then eventually you get into the environment to determine whether the environment is conducive to any solution coming into helping them and then you get down to a very specific your solution yeah, no, no, I I agree. Those are those are interesting. I love those generic questions. I love the what keeps you up at night because if somebody asked me that today, I'd say there was people letting off fireworks in the neighborhood last one, night. And that's, <laughs> you know, nothing to do with business at all. Uh, yeah. So when you come to uh, train or advise people on prospecting, what are some of the things? How would you train a somebody to be a top class prospector? What would you tell them to do? 
Well, you know, again, understanding the process, the five steps in the process to understand why why do you ask questions? Um, you know, why why do you need to have answered these questions? And one of the things that I think is the toughest part of any sale, it's certainly tough on the telephone, but it's tough face to face too. And that is giving the, the call, so to speak, or giving the meeting back to the prospect. And one of the things that we teach folks to do when we're giving the call back to the prospect, and, and that this sounds funny, but even the most senior executive is a little bit afraid of sounding stupid. So if you ask them a bunch of questions and they feel a little bit defensive about their answers, they're just not going to like that conversation very much and they're going to try to get off the phone their office as quickly as possible so what we've done and this was something that we came up with 20 years ago but we've identified a gap between there's an opening a dialogue and a close in any sales call but there's a gap between the opening and the dialogue that's critically important to fill and that's where you give the call or give the meeting back to the prospect and I'll get, I'm going to give you an example because I want to I don't want to do this just generically but I want to give your audience an example of how we would script this so to speak and one of the ways we do a transition question is to say, you know, when I meet with other CIOs and manufacturing companies, I hear the same issues over and over again. The first is there's a concern about lack of integration between their current technology and the modern tools out there today, such as business intelligence. Two, they, they have a fear of both the real cost and the opportunity cost of replacing their current solution. And because it just looks like such a huge mountain to climb. And then three, many doubts about the effectiveness of updating the current solution or the current technology. And I just wanted to ask, are any of these concerns of yours? If you ask the right questions, they're going to say, they're all concerns of mine. And you want to let them start talking about that and giving you, filling you in all of the areas of questioning, the pain, priority, process, and environment. One of the things we tell our folks is that the best call that you can possibly have is when you use the transition statement and you ask one question and they answer every other question you have. Right. I think that's that. That's the first thing, and then I think there's a there's a um, a, a method about asking what I call pain-inducing questions. Um, pain-inducing meaning you they're not top of mind. You know, maybe you have latent pain, but you want to make sure that you get down to the specifics. And again, I want to give you some specific examples of that. You know, some of them are these aren't rocket science, but you know, going back to this the same kind of example is. How does your solution, um, you know, currently communicate with some of the modern technology, such as business in, business intelligence? I can tell you that there's a whole category of manufacturing software that's 15 years old, and it doesn't communicate with business intelligence. So that's a great question to ask. You know, secondly, does your organization have a single view of the truth, or is it all siloed and it's very difficult to communicate with each other? And then lastly, and this would be a big one, do you feel like you're effectively able to communicate with your suppliers and maybe even more importantly, your clients, given the current technology? Again, the objective is not to ask an endless series of questions. The objective is to get them to stop for just a moment and take a look at what they currently have and, and where they need to be, where they would want to be, and what that might look like if they were able to get there. Yeah, those are great points and, and interesting. And the one I just go back to, I just made a note here. I love that idea of uh, understanding that if you make the executive or whatever uncomfortable, they're likely to end the call. And I think that has been uh, that has been a little bit of an issue, I think, over the last one, particularly when the challenger sale came, uh, that whole methodology mm -hmm. came on track and everybody thought, wow, now's the time to get aggressive, right? And obviously yeah. there are way, yeah, you know, there are ways of challenging, and not all of us like to be challenged, particularly early on in a conversation <laughs> with somebody who do who we don't know, who doesn't know our business. So I think that's a great point where you need to be very careful and be very empathetic to the person on the other end, and realize that uh, while you want to ask provoking questions, you don't want to necessarily provoke the person in the wrong way, right? Exactly. Yeah, and what you want to do is you want to have them be open to having a conversation with you and being able to offer insights that um, many, many senior executives, as a matter of fact, senior executives are two and a half times more responsive to a quality touch cycle than junior executives are. And that's why sometimes you'll hear people that uh, either started marketing automation companies or came out of marketing automation companies saying marketing automation does not work for everybody because not mm -hmm. every senior executive wants to be treated like the human equivalent of a pinball only getting your attention when they hit the right bumpers and scored enough points. You know, so there's, there's, there's a place that you can go here. Um, 
and the executives that are the most senior, they will, they will tell you that they engage with sellers, they engage with vendors because they know that they're going to learn something that their own internal organization either doesn't know or is afraid to tell them because they're afraid of losing their job or it's afraid of losing their position. Yeah, and I think there's some uh, I think there's some automation fatigue that's set in as well. I think a lot of people, a lot of us are just getting tired of getting bombarded constantly with things that we know are are automated or coming through systems. I'll give you an in interesting. Why I always say to people is you need to mix it up a bit. Uh, an interesting a couple of years ago, uh, another company I was running. Uh, one of our one of our salespeople who was in Canada, actually up in the Toronto area, we identified there was about ten companies in this two square mile area that fit the his target buyer. So we said, hey, how about for a change, let's just do something really old school and silly, and why don't you just go and call in, just cold call to the <laughs> desk and go in and and okay, nine of them said thank you very much for the brochure, you know we'll get it to the right person and probably filed it under trash immediately. Uh, <laughs> right. But the 10th one, uh, the one of the senior executives was so intrigued that somebody in this day and age would actually co-call at the door of the business uh, that he invited him in and said, I wish my salespeople would be take this kind of initiative. And he got a deal out of it. And I think that I think that's part of it. So yeah. would you Encourage people to really mix to mix up their their different uh, prospecting techniques. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we have a, a, a phrase for it. Um, you know, we talk about multi-touch, multimedia, multi-cycle marketing to multiply results. And what we're talking about is there's a mix of calls, voicemails, and emails, and even in some cases, direct mail, not, not all the time, but in mm -hmm. some cases, direct mail, that can be used to nudge the buyer along. And as, I've, as I said earlier in that example of the billion dollar sale, um, most and especially more senior level executives are very responsive to an approach that is not, you know, hey, this is Dan, John, call me back, <laughs> you know, yeah. so, something that tricks people into calling as opposed to giving them a good reason to call. So what you want to do is you want to have your, your voicemails uh, kind of linked to your email. If you make a second phone call and you don't get them. Sometimes you don't leave a voicemail. Sometimes you zero out and just make sure the person isn't on long-term leave or something like that. Yeah to another call, leave another voicemail, send an email, and you might even do that on a third cycle of contact over a 10-day period. What we find is that we'll reach probably 50% of our target market during that 10-day period, and we'll have about 20 to 30% that reach back out to us, either by voicemail or by email, and letting us know when a convenient time to talk is. And that's if you have um, given them a reason, you know, get, get their attention and give them a reason to want to have a discussion. So let's talk. Uh, let's talk because this is interesting. Let's. Uh, we talked about some of the things to do, but let's talk about some of the common mistakes. Uh, when you go and work with organizations, what are some of the common prospecting mistakes that you see or that you see happening and that you see prevalent today? Pro probably the single biggest is the gap between marketing and sales when it comes to lead follow up. Mm -hmm. And we have a specific recommendation to make about this is that when you have an when you have a sales rep who gets an opportunity for marketing, number one, is there a common definition of a lead? A guy, uh, an author by the name of Brian Carroll, came up with the universal lead definition, um, not too, probably five six years ago, maybe even a little longer than that. And and sales and marketing have to be on the same page as to what the definition of a qualified lead is. Right now, I'd say ninety nine, if not nine hundred ninety nine out of a thousand, ninety nine out of a hundred companies don't have it don't share a common definition of lead between marketing and sales. And as a result, marketing is generating leads that sales doesn't value. They're ending up in the equivalent of a lower left-hand desk drawer. That's where they used to end up 20 years ago. Now they end up in CRM someplace and never to be seen again. And there's a way of fixing that, and it's what we call the judicial branch, that if you do have a common lead definition that everybody's agreed to, and by the way, that's probably not going to happen between just sales and marketing. You might have to get the CEO, a COO, even a CFO involved in this discussion to make sure that there's a sane definition of a lead. And then if a lead goes over to sales and sales proactively rejects it, then is it because it didn't meet the lead definition or is it because they called twice, the prospect didn't call back and they thought, well, it must not have been a good lead. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, if it does go back to marketing and it's not qualified, then you can fix that in marketing. If it gets to sales and it's sales accepted, then it has to go then to the sales qualified step and eventually to a closed one. 
you should be able to manage that through the sales process. But the biggest disconnect right now is that handoff between marketing and sales. And there are just literally tens of millions of dollars being squandered, if not hundreds of millions of dollars being squandered. Because the other thing, by the way, is, is that nurturing can triple the return on any marketing investment. So if you end up with a situation where the lead goes to sales, instead of it ending up in a black hole, it needs to at some point get back to marketing so that it can be nurtured along to the next step. So we, we have a high degree of success with nurturing leads for our clients, either because they couldn't get through it turns out that now's not the right time. So we know that we're not, we're not going to turn that over to sales. We're going to follow up in a month or two months or three months or whatever it needs to be. And then we get that lead to sales when it's the right time for them. That's excellent. Excellent. Uh, so it, it sounds to me like it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward if you just get marketing and sales in a room and actually sit down and ag agree a common definition, it would go a long way to, uh, to solving some of the issues. But then again, getting sales and marketing in the same room to agree about <laughs> a lot of things uh, seems to have been an issue that uh, very few companies have managed to overcome throughout the years. Um, okay, we're at uh, we're at nine twenty six, so we're we're bumping up against the end of this session. So maybe just briefly, uh, if I want to turn into a world class prospecting organization, uh, what are what are the three things I should be looking at right now? Well, probably. Um I wrote an article that was published yesterday about account-based marketing, and I think you're seeing, reading, and, and hearing a lot about account-based marketing. And I think it's absolutely right. It's actually been around, arguably, it's been around since the early 90s when Peppers and Rogers wrote about the lines of account-based marketing. But um, the ITSMA had um, some additional insight about account-based marketing maybe th 13, 14 years ago. And and I'll give you just a really quick example, but we had a client come to us and said, here's 4,200 companies and 7,500 contacts, go call them all. And <laughs> we knew because it was a very specific target audience that we knew that, first of all, there weren't 4,200 prospects out there. The bad news is there were 803 of them, and they don't they only had 385 of them. And we really only needed to talk about talk to about 1,500 people instead of 7,200 people or 7,500 people. So instead of spending $172,000 on that project, they spent $49,000 on the project and saved, you know, over $120,000. But the point is that target very specifically, make sure that you have absolutely the right contacts, you know, whether you call it blue sheeting Miller, from the old Miller Hyman days or whatever, you know, get all of your information in a row, understand what their environment is, and then talk specifically to them as what they call a market of one one to many, it's one to one. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, in this case, 803 prospects, 1500 targets, that's pretty easy to get your arms around. It's very difficult to get your arms around 4200 prospects or, and, and 7500 contacts. So just be, look into um, Engageo, uh, e -N -G -A -G -I -O com. It's John Miller's new organization. They're doing a great job talking about account based marketing, and they've got great information about the process and the technology around it. Man, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so this this thirty minutes has flown as it uh, as it tends to do, but it's sure great great information. Um, so what we always like to ask our guests at the end is, uh, tell me about what is your supercharged sales tip. So tell me about what is one of your daily uh, secrets to success, to getting in the mindset for success. What do you do every day to get yourself in top gear? I think the most important thing is to get into a rhythm. I, I think, you know, all of us, um, especially those of us who have gotten older, <laughs> all of us, um, you know, sort of uh, get tired of, of uh, <laughs> doing certain things. And, you know, if I can get into a rhythm, and I, we use our CRM for that, but if, if I can get into a rhythm, you know, it really takes away all of that um, all of the problems and that kind of thing. You know, you just sit down and you're going to say, you know, for the next two hours, I'm going to hit these 50 prospects, whether it's with an email or a call, a voicemail, or going out and looking them up. For example, you know, put a Google alert out there. And if something, something comes up in your Google alert, follow up on that specifically. But, you know, really just generate a rhythm. And you can't sustain it all day. So you have to give yourself little breaks. But you can sustain it for a couple hour period and just really be heads down, really focused and just cranking along. And I find that I get a lot more work done in that two hour period than I might all day if I didn't have that focus. 
Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of a of an operating rhythm. There's a, a friend of mine who really advocates that all the time about getting into an operating rhythm. Okay, Dan, this yeah. has been fantastic. This has been a, a great session. I hope uh, it's really helped people out there to get uh, to understand how to prospect better. Uh, Dan, how can people get in contact with you if they want to learn more about what you do? Go to pointclear.com, just like it sounds, pointclear.com, or you can email me directly if you have any questions. I'm happy to field questions, uh, no matter what, what you're asking about, to dan.mcdade at pointclear.com. Great. Well, again, thanks, Dan. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Martha in Vienna. That's, another, that's a wrap for another session of Sales Chats. Um, we'll be back in another couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much.